officially welcome. Thank you for coming tonight to this presentation. Forest Bathing 101, uh, my name is Amy Dion and I am a certified mindful outdoor and forest therapy guide uh, living in Dover and my, my business name is Mindful Wandering. So today's topics include a little bit about um, my background, my history and how I got into guiding. Um, I'm going to ask you to share a tree. You'll find out that, more about that. Um, we will do also, I'll invite you to do a mindful breathing. Hello, welcome. Joshua, I'm trying to show you the dream. We're just shutting it just a crack so you don't have the outside. Thank you. Um, I will also go over the terminology, um, some of the different names you might have heard for the practice, and then the origins of the practice, the benefits, what it's not, and what it is, and what it promotes. We'll do some sun breathing or sun breaths, and I'll also talk about what it is that I do and what you can expect on walk. Um, we'll finish with a well, sensory invitation and question and answers, welcome. And then um, but there is a walk that's um, following the presentation, not today, but a couple months out in June on the first day of summer from 5.30 to 7.30. And this will be at the Dover Community Trail, the Watson Road end, which has lots of parking and generally, generally pretty quiet and uh, more suitable for uh, bigger groups. I think there, I believe there will be a registration cap. I don't, I'm trying to recall what that was. Um, I believe it was 12 people, maybe 15. And the registration will be required. You can do that through the library, but it is free. Okay, so just a show of hands. Um, how many people have heard the term forest bathing before you signed up for this? presentation. Okay. How about Shinrin Yoku? And how about forest therapy? Okay. So I will uh, go over the similarities and the slight differences between all those terms in uh, just a bit. But um, a very simple definition is that forest bathing is an immersive experience in a natural setting using a sequence of invitations, which I'll talk about a little bit. We walk at a very slow, mindful pace, um, more of a stroll, how well being invited by your guide or invite yourself if you're doing self-guided walk to savor all the sights and sounds and smells associated with the natural elements. So a little bit about my background. I live here in Dover with my husband and our two sons. Many years ago, I went to UNH and got my bachelor's in psychology and then became a certified fitness trainer um, through the International Sports Science Association. And for a long time, um, I was at the works. Um, so I was in the wellness industry as a trainer and an instructor. And my, my focus was the prenatal and postpartum population. Well, um, with the onset of the pandemic that pretty much ended with um, gyms shutting down and then when they reopened, class sizes dwindled. And um, so I decided to just focus on being a stay-at-home mom and, and homeschooling our son and also became a lot more involved with um, nature and how it affected our family and researching how it affected and why. and and what more um, I could do with that information. So in the meantime, um, we just started spending a lot more time outside. And even though we've always been a really outdoorsy family, um, walking and, and hiking and kayaking and camping, um, 
we were doing a lot more outside time because if we were going to be home and we didn't have any place to go or anything to do and the roads were clear, let's get out on our bikes. Let's go for walks every day and let's explore someplace new because we have this time and we don't want to be in the house and just, what are we going to do with ourselves? So um, it became a little, a lot different actually with, with less to think about, with less mind clutter. We really started noticing and paying attention to things more. And so it wasn't so much about going to a destination or we're exercising or getting exercise. It was just like slowing down and noticing. So that was a good change. Um, and it definitely affected our relationship with, with the earth. It just became, we started to really love it on a, on a deeper level. And I've always been an outdoorsy person, um, maybe some years not as much as others. Uh, you know, when you're <laughs> you're working full time for the first time out of school, when you're in a building and, you know, getting time outside is just a little thing you do on the weekends. But um, I was always happiest outdoors whenever I could get out. And as a kid, um, my best memories involved being outside and taking picnics by myself. I'm an only child, so a lot of it was was doing this alone. Um, I didn't really understand at the time why, or I didn't really think about it, why it felt so good to be outside, why it made me feel relaxed or peaceful or just happier, just, just something I did. This is one of our yearly camping trips at White Lake State Park. This is what, uh, this is what we did <laughs> for our family vacations. Um, I didn't know anything different, but so we went camping. We went to White Lake and I played at the campsite. I dug around in the dirt for snails and whatever I could find. Welcome. Thank you. And uh, just had a great time by myself and then swimming, of course. And then um, here's some pictures from that time of 2020 and the pandemic. And uh, some of the, all the adventures that we had, different places that we went. Some places were places that we had already been to and some places were new. Some places I went to with just the kids and some places that was all four of us. So most of these pictures, well, all these pictures I think are all four of us. So my husband would have been the one taking the picture. So that kind of represented our year and the years to come. But another big turning point um, was reading a particular book um, called Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louv. So I'll get more into this later, but these words, they spoke to me on a very personal level. There were certain things that he said and I feel like everything started falling into place at this point. So this book and, and lots of others that I read um, would made me realize how much we all need nature and how important it is to us on so many levels, emotionally, physically, everything. So then horse bathing came into my life. It's something that I had heard about maybe 10 years or so ago. And admittedly, when I heard the term, I was skeptical. I thought, it's kind of, really, what? What does that mean? Does that mean lay in the forest? What does that mean? And I didn't really think anything more of it because it was, it just, I heard it just like a little snippet of it. And then it was something that you started hearing more about. And I was curious, but there were no opportunities in the area. And then I got an email from uh, CELT, which is a local land organization. And I was intrigued. Definitely, yes, I want to do this. So they had limited spots. I signed up myself and my son. And we went on this three hour guided walk. And I really did not know what to expect. I researched uh, forest bathing and Shinrin Yoku a little bit before the walk, but it didn't really tell me like what was going to happen. Um, that was just part of the, the mystery of it all. I knew the benefits of it, but, but yes, got a lot. Got a lot out of that walk, that one walk, um, not just personally, but then I realized that this is something that I wanted to do. 
I found a way to combine my love of nature with my passion for wanting to help other people, which is what I had been doing in my previous career. So I got in touch with our guide. I talked to him a lot right after the walk. Um, we exchanged emails and then back and forth communication. He recommended um, the schools that I ended up getting trained through. Uh, Kripalu School of Mindful Opera Leadership. You might have heard of Kripalu. Um, it's in the Berkshires, Massachusetts. It's a um, yoga, no, mostly known as a yoga resort. But the School of Mindful Opera Leadership is a little bit newer from 2018. And then the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy Guides, which was founded uh, back in 2012. So now I'm going to ask you if you would like to share about a tree, something that's been um, either a particular tree or one that you just happen to like, like for example, I've always liked birches. I don't know why, I just do. So I'll go first. I actually, my answer probably would have been birches before. And I think I've changed it to white pine because it's just shown up continuously in my life. As a child, we had white pines everywhere. And I used to like to hang out on the roots and sit there, have picnics. And now we live around white pines. And um, I'm definitely just enjoy them. So anybody wants to just pop up and say, yeah, I like this tree that, how about Joshua? Um, I don't understand. What? I no, don't you don't, know. nobody, no, you don't even, nobody even has to answer you, really. I, I'm saying I like white pine, my favorite tree. Great, thanks. Anybody else have a special tree or? When I was a child, I used to spend hours sitting in a cherry tree. Mm -hmm. in my backyard and I would sit so still that the birds would come into the tree too so I might not even be that far away from me. So, yeah. that's nice. well, I, I grew up in the city but in my neighborhood now it's mostly oak and I really look forward to like the acorns falling down in the fall and the squirrels hiding them away and there's just something, and there's just something about seeing that very first one. It, it's just that whole cycle that it reminds me of. You know, that things will be renewed and renewed. They go to sleep and then they'll come back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yes. When I was a child, across the street from where we live, this is a part of Boston, West Roxbury, and it was high up for okay. Yeah, up a hill that you came, and this was like our house was on the right side, and this was on the left side. And it was a house that was particularly interesting. It, it wasn't, uh, I don't know how long it was there, but anyway, it was actually built from stones, like field stones type of thing, right? And um, it had a very large size pine tree. And I can recall some, um, I don't know if it was around Halloween, but it certainly kind of fits the idea of Halloween. Uh, in the nighttime, the winds were howling or whatever, and the tree was kind of rocking back and forth that I could see like within my bedroom that my sister and I had together, uh, like the outline of the tree looking like Using my imagination, kind of like this is really spooky and everything. A witch or something. Cool, thank you. Yes. So, where I live, it, um, the view from my deck looks just like your picture up there. There's trees everywhere. I am in the middle of. I can't even pick a favorite tree. Mm -hmm. All of the trees I love dearly. And in fact, when I saw when when I first went to this house, when I was looking for a house to buy, on the way to the house, I was surrounded by trees on both sides. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't even know what this house looks like, but I don't care. Yes. <laughs> this is where I want to live. 
and that is where I live right now. Mm -hmm. That's yes. I love fresh cheese too. Um, and one of the reasons I think I love them started when I was young and there were birch trees outside my bedroom window. But as an adult, I have admired how they bend but don't always break. Mm -hmm. And so I find that very inspiring. I mean, you know, especially after the snow reaches on us so recently and how the snow weighs so heavily and sometimes it breaks them, but often it just bends them. And mm -hmm. in time, as things melt, they sort of come back and I just find that very inspiring. Yes. Yes, I definitely find a lot of meaning in that. But in response to that, I'm going to say during this last storm, one of a maple tree, one of the maple trees to the side of my house did break and it's right now fallen into the side of my house and it looks just so sad <laughs> lying there. <laughs> I um it just I and I and trying to even find anybody to get rid of it or take care of it and help me with it is like almost impossible now. All the tree people are completely swamped mm -hmm. with um, with work trees that have fallen on houses and on and on. So yeah, um, yeah, but they do break, and when they do, it's really sad. Yeah, <laughs> well, to me, it's it quite expensive. <laughs> right, right. Um, you know, I used to when I would see tree, and I still I feel. Personally, I'm like kind of sad when I see a tree that looks otherwise healthy that's fallen, but I've started to look at it differently these last few years because then you see the cycle of how that tree like breaks down and it feeds the earth, like the creatures that live in it, the creatures that help it to decompose and, and it's like this whole cycle. So I now when I see a tree down, I feel a little less sad because, well, you know what, that's going to be a home for some certain creatures that are going to love this and then it's going to rot and it's going to, and some other creatures are going to be in there and then it's eventually just going to go back into the earth. So trees are really, oh gosh, it'll, we could just talk just about trees. I'm sure all of us just, I mean, yeah, they're really special. They're really special. Does anybody have another tree story? Yes. Uh, this is, uh, I lived in Connecticut for actually 50 years. And this was a oak tree that was believed to be probably over 200 years old, maybe 300 years old, and it was at a point that it was finally in it. It was maybe like a little big sign by the side of the road because you couldn't tell because there were a lot of trees and other growing things in the area. So a friend of a dear friend of mine and we made a point that we were going to go to it. Okay, so we went in to see it with someone and it was just kind of a very interesting kind mm -hmm. of a, uh, experience to do that. And as I was thinking about was this a story that would be interesting just as a point of reference. And then it, was known as the China Oak State, mm. that in the area where Hartford is basically, okay, back in colonial times, and this was kind of like prior to the American Revolution starting, but enough that the colonists were very much distressed and fed up with how they were being treated. Uh, we're going to move on real quick. Okay. So <laughs> anyway, they had, uh, I don't know how long before the all started, but the people that were governing Connecticut at that time made a charter in terms of rules and regulations mm -hmm. and how things would function and so on. And that was known by the British. So they were anxious to get their hands on that so they could destroy it type of thing, and it was hidden in an oak tree oh, in the general hybrid area that there was evidently some kind of a 
uh, hot place where the hole and the tree got high. Oh, wow. and they got like stuck in there. It was not discovered. So it's safe. Wow. That, I have not heard that before. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for your, your stories and shares. Um, so now we're just going to move into a quick mindful breathing break. So when we do this outside, it's just a way to kind of help us to transition kind of away from everything we're thinking about normally and getting into nature. And when I say nature, it could be your backyard, it could be your patio, you don't even have to be out in the woods. So doing some deep breathing or just some mindful breathing just helps us to shift into a uh, more restful state. So we'll begin by, if you just wanna allow your eyes to either take a soft gaze or close your eyes. And just notice how the chair supports your body. And how the floor supports your feet. And then breathing in through the nose, filling your stomach and lungs. Slowly exhaling, if you can, through pursed lips or whatever feels comfortable. And again, nice deep breath in through the nose. And out through the mouth. Trying to make that exhale as long as possible. In through the nose. Slowly out through the mouth. One more. Just some deep in through the nose. Filling the lungs. Once you fill the lungs, imagine your stomach filling. And then slowly, as slow as you can, out through the mouth. And when you're ready, open your eyes, with a regular gaze. When I was doing my studies at Propalo, they suggested doing that once a day, just three, three breaths, three deep mindful breaths a day. Makes a difference. Little things sometimes. Right. I go the right side here. So let's talk about the origins of forest bathing. So it has its roots in something called Shinrin Yoku, which means taking in the atmosphere of the forest or bathing in the forest. And this was developed in the 80s by the forest agency of the Japanese government as a response to a health crisis in Japan, which some would say is still happening. Um, why? Because the Japanese medical community found there was a connection between time spent in nature and increased health. People were literally working themselves to death. There's even a Japanese word for it, karoshi, means death by overwork. So something had to be done, something has to be done still. So since then, researchers are still, over the years, continuing to study the psychological and physiological effects of forest bathing. What they have found is positive correlations between forest bathing and increased senses of well-being and relaxation, with some emotional 
and then an increase in immunity, along with reductions of stress hormones, heart rate, blood pressure, and anxiety. Now in Japan, they, um, they actually measure this. Cortisol levels are measured through uh, samples of saliva, heart rate, blood pressure, the usual way. Anxiety, of course, would be um, self-reported. And so would when sense of well-being and relaxation. But um, it's treated, it's treated medically there. And then every now and then you'll, you'll see a quote on the bottom here, um, something that I've come across that I, I want to share. So terminology. So this this kind of tripped me up a little bit when I first started uh, studying as a mindful outdoor guide and forest therapy guide. What's the, I, I'm hearing all these terms, what's the difference? So Shinrin Yoku, as I mentioned, is a Japanese practice um, and they consider it a medicine for the body. So forest bathing and forest therapy are pretty much interchangeable terms. They're inspired by Shinrin Yoku but without the medical approach. And that's what we, that's what I'll be discussing. Um, mindful guided walks, it's pretty much the same thing. If I'm depending on what part of my training I'm bringing in, um, my Apollo training is a little bit more directive than my ANFT training. I, that probably doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but by directive, I mean like the centering practice that we did or I might ask you to, let's do some nature journaling. That would be a little more directive than a suggestion or an invitation that's very open-ended. So for simplicity's sake, I'm just going to refer to the, what we're doing is forest bathing. Lisa. Yes. Could you tell me how the Shinrin Yoko, Yoko is medical? What would they do differently in a medical approach, it wouldn't be very similar to your, what you do? No, they're actually, so they're measuring, um, they have forests that like doctors will give them a prescription to right. go and forest bathe. And they have forest bathing practitioners who are like doctors basically. And they do, they'll have people sit and they're not doing guided walks necessarily, but the people will go and, and sit in the forest in these designated spots. Like they have, um, they're set up for that, like different paths and seats and maybe a waterfall. And then when they're done, they'll get everything measured again. So they'll have somebody checking their heart rate, their blood pressure, their cortisol, and maybe more. So that's how it's different there. It's really interesting though. And I've, I've seen forest bathing courses in Japan, so I didn't know yeah. really how it was. Different from yeah, well, and that might be similar to what we do here yeah. too. Um, there's there's another level of what they do that's more like people go to like they have to get a PhD in it. It's it's a whole different you know type of force bathing than what we're doing here for sure. But it would be nice if doctors here would would write a prescription for it for people. I mean. Or you could write your own prescription, right? <laughs> Good luck at the meeting. So horse bathing here in the US. So um, this practice really only just recently came out. Oh, did you have a question? No, I was waiting. Oh, okay, yes. Sorry. No, no, that's fine. Um, so the, uh, the practice only recently came into the US and that was um, through the Association of Nature and Forest Therapy, which was formed in 2012 by Amos Clifford. Um, Amos Clifford is a former psychotherapist. He was also a wilderness guide or is, might be still, and um, also um, studies Buddhism. So he's very, a lot of deep roots there. And he, studied Shinrin Yoku, went to Japan and came back to the United States and kind of created a, what, what we have here, or what I practice. He also wrote a wonderful book. Unfortunately, you'll we'll see the, both books here, but it's called Your Guide to Forest Bathing. I don't know if they have it here at the library, um, but I have seen it in bookstores and definitely online. It's a wonderful little book that talks about Pretty much every, it covers everything that I'm gonna to cover today, but 
on a more detailed level. And then at the end of the book, there's also some self-guided um, practices that you can do. Um, the other school, so in 2018, the Kripalu School of Mindful Outdoor Leadership was created by Micah Mortali, who was a student of Amos and also a yoga instructor and the author of um, this book, Rewilding, which fortunately you can't see right there because my, my face is there, but. What is the name, Rewilding? Rewilding, yes. And he's, um, he's in Massachusetts. Um, and uh, he also has a, uh, he's, he's a really neat guy to, if you're on social media, he's another one that I would recommend following. He, he does a lot of um, ancestral um, skills, he, fire starting, hunting with bows, um, just a really interesting guy. So again, the ANFT and Kripalu guide programs don't take the medical approach but we have our roots in Shinrin Yoku. And we all agree that mindful time in nature um, has a positive effect on our well being, even if we don't measure them. So, a quote from Micah's book. Robin and I have the honor of meeting both of these gentlemen in June. They are doing a conference at Kupalu. And these are like celebrities to us, these, these people. So we're pretty excited. And I believe anybody can, can go, not just guides. So go to Kripalu's website. You could, you could sign up. It's a four-day immersive. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> and we're going to bring my book for them to sign. Both the books. Yes. <laughs> so Richard Liu, uh, another one I would love to meet. Um, I mentioned his book briefly. There's other books I could talk about too that are also talk about the importance of nature and, and its effects, groundbreaking books. I'm focusing on this one because this one is a had a particularly strong effect on me and my family. In fact, my son reads it, just flips through it every day pretty much. Right. We have maybe not every day, but a lot. Like the, the book, I got it at the thrift store, um, which I'll forever be grateful to that person who decided to share it with the rest of the world because I had not heard of it before. And we got it and it was in pretty good condition and now it's it's very well loved. So he was the one, he, he coined this term nature deficit disorder. Um, it's not a medical diagnosis or anything. He doesn't claim it to be. But what it means is that Kids have, and adults too, have shifted from spending time outside and spending more of their time inside and becoming disconnected from the outdoors, especially the last few decades. I would say even the last couple of decades, um, extremely so. There's several theories on this, but um, it has affected everybody. It affects kids, it affects Adults, it affects the environment. So it is worrisome. And we're hoping that there's an awareness being created. And hopefully just you here tonight and me talking about it is, is, is also creating some awareness of it if you haven't heard of this before. I'm sure you've had some sort of inkling that kids are, and, and adults are spending a lot more time um, inside than, than is really preferable. But, uh, According to the EPA, we're spending 90% of our time inside and 11 hours a day, and maybe more at this point since the study was released, 11 hours a day on a screen. So we have become connected to technology and disconnected from nature, which is so really our true home. And what could our lives look like? if we were as immersed in nature as we are in technology. I just um, yes. have a comment along with that. I was reading along these same lines and also had a comment about our ability, uh, our vision, uh, actual able to see distances yes. um, because we spend so much time on screens and indoors, you know, seeing about six feet at the most, right. that our ability to see and focus um, the far, far away, like you might outside walking a trail or in the mountains or something like that is diminishing. 
because of um, the constant focus on the near yeah. or the nearer. Yeah, I thought that was pretty interesting. It, it was interesting. That, you know, physically. Right. Progress. Right. Oh, definitely. Even to notice things for them. Right. Yeah, no, it is. It's interesting and, and disturbing, too, right? So yeah, there's definitely physical effects that go along with it as well. Um, and I think he, he might mention those. He, there's a lot of stuff he covers in there. Um, it's a very, it's a really good book. Um, he's written a few others that... Vitamin N is, a, is one, vitamin N for nature, um, the nature principle, um, our wild calling. It's, there's a few others, and I think, I'm trying to remember if I have linked to them on my website, but I should if I haven't. Uh, there's, just, there's a lot of really, there's a lot of really interesting things to read out there about. And it's not all, you know, like doom and gloom, like, oh, no, this is where we're headed. It's like, no, we can, this is what we're meant to do, and this is how we can connect. So, it's um, it's always bringing awareness, but also here's what we can do, and it gives hope. And then you know that there's other like-minded people out there that are that are trying to do the same thing and encouraging other people to do the same thing. Realize what's going on. So why do we need this? Uh, well, you know that feeling when you, especially when you've been on vacation or. On, it's Monday, and you've been maybe unplugged. Well, we go away for camping or an Airbnb, whatever. I just shut my notifications off. I don't check my email. I don't check social media. It feels really weird at first, mm -hmm. but then it feels really good. Mm -hmm. But then when I go back to check it, I'm like, oh, do you ever feel how it, like what does it feel like that it's like dread almost sometimes even if it's good like you're expecting some good emails it's just maybe it's just all the information I don't know or maybe when you're hear the news or you're reading the news or stuck in traffic and like to work on top of that it, there's a usually a physical response that goes along with that right there's your heart rate just quickens and maybe your knee shakes a little bit or you know you sweat your face gets flushed it's not a great feeling and these are just regular everyday activities but in our brain it's like flight or fight or flight like we're, we're supposed to be running from something that's chasing us and we're really not in danger these are just but this is how we respond so our sympathetic nervous system has been triggered by these perceived threats, but we can activate the parasympathetic response or what's called rest and digest just by being outside. And being outside can be just, if you work in an office or a building, maybe on your break, just step outside for five minutes and just just enjoy that just being outside, even if there's no trees, even just, just being outside sometimes can make all the difference. So what nature can do for us? Well, being in the woods is like a healing balm. And I didn't realize this, but trees, secrete these organic compounds or tur they call them either terpines or phytoncides. Uh, pines in particular, maybe another reason I like pines, I appreciate pines so much more now. And these compounds actually help reduce stress. They boost our immunity and reduce our heart rate just by breathing them in. So it's like aromatherapy directly from nature. Of course, it's not just the smell of nature. It's also, you know, what do we hear? Birds chirping, leaves rustling, the wind, feeling the air on our skin, maybe a raindrop, a rough bark of a pine tree, noticing the way that the light casts shadows, branches swaying, tasting tea from herbs. We've grown in our own garden. Oh, 
This is one of my, use this little laser that I need over here because it's fun. <laughs> this is one of my favorite quotes or mantras to say to myself when I'm doing mindful breathing and I'm just trying to get out of my head and just yeah. back into my body. Breathing in, I feel my body. Breathing out, I feel the earth. It was beautiful. Yes. You, I think you did a walking meditation. I'm alive and I know where you are. Yes. Oh, I I love there's so many quotable you know things. He just passed away what about a year ago or so. Yeah. He was a good writer. Yes. He contributed, yeah, he, he wrote several different books too. One of the favorite things that really struck me when I when I started really paying attention to what it means to be mindful, because my first thought was, oh, meditation is so hard. I don't like meditation. <laughs> I have to try too hard to shut my brain off. And then I realized, or I was, I was instructed or gently uh, told, well, no, that's not what mindfulness is. Mindfulness isn't about forcing your mind to shut off. It's about being in the present moment. What does that mean? It means paying attention to what's going on and what your body's doing. And he had a really, oh my gosh, he talked about doing the dishes. He talked about being mindful when you do the dishes. Now for us, most of us doing the dishes is, I know it's a big chore in our house. Who's yeah. doing the dishes? <laughs> There's dishes in the sink and I'm not happy. Somebody's got to do them. <laughs> but uh, I read what he said about doing the dishes and it really change my perspective. Unfortunately, not enough that I think about it every time, but basically what he said is if we, if we can only concentrate, if we can only pay attention to doing the dishes when we're doing the dishes, water running over our hands, sponge, soap, the motion of cleaning the plates. If we're not in that moment, we've lost that moment. We've lost part of our lives. And I thought, wow, oh, so I could, I'm, I'm literally losing part of my life by doing something and being resentful of it instead of just thinking about what I'm doing and maybe enjoying it. I, I'm enjoying the fact that I have running water. I have privileged to have running water and soap. And so anyway, different way to look at, at mindfulness, thinking about doing the dishes differently. Yes. Say I was a sandwich bad for 12 years. Um, I always did the dishes by hand. Yeah. Because that was my break. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I, I don't know if I was quite that mindful, but um, I like the dishes. Yeah. So Tasks that I could finish. It sounds like it was mindful. If you were able to enjoy it and be in it. And yes. There are things to be said about those those menial tasks, right? They can be an escape sometimes. Folding socks, you know, just a way to just decompress. Uh, so I have QR codes that are not showing up. I'm sorry because my my face is in the way. So any anything that I have here that I'm giving numbers, um, I have QR codes that scan to the actual studies. So now you can see that where I'm pulling these numbers from. So here's some actual physical benefits that we can see. Uh, after a two hour walk, a 50% increase in natural killer cells. And those are the cells that attack the things in our body that aren't supposed to be there. So it helps boost our immunity. Um, just looking at a forest scene, um, I believe in that study, they weren't outside, they were just looking at a picture of the outdoors, kind of like that painting behind us here, dropping cortisol, stress hormone, and then also dropping heart rate and blood pressure after doing a relaxed forest stroll. It doesn't say how long that stroll was, just a relaxed forest stroll. Um, there might be more information in the study that I didn't see. But those are some measurable benefits. You know, I'm, I'm reading, and maybe others have noticed, there's a lot in the news lately about how cancer is showing up in younger people. 
And I'm wondering if it isn't somehow tied to more technology, less time outside, and the immune system. Yeah. Get more people are eating too. That's processed great. foods and yeah. all the time. As well. yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know that the, and I'm always hesitant to say it prevents cancer, but I've heard, I've heard other guides say, well, being outside can, can help prevent cancer because it's boosting those natural killer cells. So there is something to that because if you have that boosted immunity and you're fighting things off invaders, then yeah, if you're spending less time outside, then yeah, I can see the connection there for sure. So some things um, that guided walks are not. So when I first um, talked about this practice with my, my friends and, and people I knew, they um, talked, they said, yeah, I, I'm looking forward to going on a hike with you or a walk with you. And I, I wanted to make sure they knew it wasn't a hike. So again, so guide walks are not hikes. And then, and then people also are concerned that, oh, I, I have a bad knee. Um, but you know, of course you should definitely check with your doctor if you're doing any sort of physical activity and you have restrictions but walks are generally inclusive to almost anybody, depending on the terrain, of course. The, the walks that I've done have been flat, wide trails, so definitely use um, a walking stick or a cane. So it's not about exercise. It's not even about thinking about exercise. It's just a stroll or a saunter or a wander. And when I say slow, I mean slow. And I think, Initially, sometimes people have a hard time with that. I know I did at first. Luckily, the group that I was in was was big enough and I was towards the back, so I was able to follow their pace. Otherwise, I think I probably would have walked. What I was thinking was slow wasn't really that slow. So it's really, really slow. It's not an educational walk or a nature walk or a lecture, so I won't be pointing out birds or, or identifying trees. I mean, that might come up, like maybe if when we're doing a social, um, the circle share, but that's not the, the point. Like if I, you know, I might mention, oh, I was sitting underneath a shag bark hickory and a uh, hickory not fell on my head. <laughs> that would, but other than that, I'm not going to, it's not meant to uh, be something educational. Um, in fact, there's really not a lot of talking at all during these walks, they're, they're pretty silent. Um, it's not about photography either or sightseeing. I know, that can be really tricky. Like I, you know, when we go out in nature, we want to, you know, bring our phones, bring our cameras. And this is a time to just be disconnected from technology. I mean, I have to bring my phone just for safety with me, but I keep it shut off or do not disturb mode. And for pictures, I suggest mental pictures. Just, just try to imaginary camera and that way you're in the moment um okay here's an example the, the eclipse mm -hmm. um we, we went up north to be in the field of totality and when totality happened i did not take pictures because i wanted to be so present in that moment rather than fiddling with my camera which i knew wouldn't take a good picture anyway so sometimes it's just about really soaking it in and not not taking it in any other way, if that makes sense. And then, of course, it's not destination or, or uh, uh, outcome oriented. It's just about the relationship between you and the forest, and that's your own personal relationship. So there's no there's no expected outcome here. There's nothing that I would suggest to you that would happen. It's just it's your experience. Um, here's some pictures of some recent walks, um, some different things it's from last year. So this is kind of what guided walks look like. Here we are headed into the woods. Here we are getting ready to do uh, a little bit of mindful breathing. And then towards the end here, here's my pointer. We're doing some, um, some sun breaths which is mindful breathing with a little bit of movement. And then here, we're doing, this is the final 
thing that we do is called the tea ceremony or circle share. So we gather in a circle, something that humans have been doing for millennia, and we share tea. It's completely optional if you want to have it or not. I usually make mine out of pine needles or herbs from my garden. And then I usually uh, I provide a light snack too if it's a long walk. So guided How walks. Long basically does the walk, an average walk. Sure, average two hours. Uh, longest is usually three hours. The first walk I went on was three hours. I've been doing them around the two hour range because I feel like that's a little more, people are more likely to want to do it versus three hours seems like more of a commitment maybe. So maybe the three hour walk would be for somebody that's done one before and wants a longer experience. And do you have to travel far to reach these places? No. Um, take place? Yeah, I generally hold them. I mean, I urban forestry in Portsmouth and Newington, um, Newington Forest, awesome. though they do limit the amount of participants that I, that they'll let me have. Um, the Great Bay Wildlife Refuge Center in Newington, Dover Community Trail. Um, so all local places I've been, I've been doing them just in the Dover. Just there's so many, I mean, there's lots of lovely paths everywhere, but I've been doing mostly around the Dover area. Um, College Woods in, in Durham, I did recently too. Yeah. yeah. I just wondered where you would find forest to go to. <laughs> yeah, so when I say forest, it's just, just a some place, yeah, just a path in the woods or a path in nature, so. How walkable are they? They're always gonna be flat. You could have a cane, yes. Pretty much all the trails that I've been guiding on are wide enough. Uh, there was one trail that had some mud. Um, it was with a particular group though that hired me and it was mostly younger kids. So that was, or not younger kids, teenagers. Um, so that wasn't so much of a, of a concern. They navigated the, around the mud and whatnot, but generally when I choose a, a path, it'll be wide and flat if possible. That way it makes it easier to do the walk too because then everybody can hear me versus single file. <laughs> and I don't like to shout. I'm not a loud person anyway. So people are always saying, can you say that again? And especially on a, on a walk like this, I don't want to be yelling. So I try to keep it where everybody can hear me. So yes, local and accessible. Um, but yeah, you know, basically a walk is about just using, being aware, using our senses, um, being still, being quiet within, just having that stillness, just, it's amazing when you slow your body down, how your mind follows. Just the next time you go for a, a, just a regular walk, whether it's in your neighborhood or on the community trail, just, just try it, just try walking. or maybe a little faster than this, but just that speed and just see how it, see if you notice anything. Resting too, it's a great way for people to just, without necessarily stopping, which we do stop. And then I invite people to go out and wander in the woods and find out what I call a sit spot. Um, I'll use that term a lot in, in walks, let's see. So there is rest. There is rest as far as just being out there and being at a slow pace, and then also just immersing yourself in nature and kind of forgetting about the rest of the world for a little while. Um, and then connection is another one. Now I didn't put in here, I, I, I mostly talked about connection with nature and how, I love this quote, people protect what they love. And it's so true because the more that you connect with nature, the more you're gonna care about it the more you're going to care about that tree that falls or the tree that gets cut down because you have a connection to it now. But there's also, when you go on a guided walk, it is about community. So it's, it's a connection with those people. And the first walk I went on and we sat in a circle and everybody shared, there were some people that didn't want to share at first. And that was fine. They passed. It was like a little talking piece, like a pine cone or something. And if I felt like sharing, I would, but some people didn't want to, or didn't feel like they needed to share anything. 
and that's fine. It's just the listening too. If we're just sitting there and you're listening and you're listening with your whole heart to that other person and all these people, it, it has an effect. It, it changes you a little. You feel that connection with these people. And then if you choose to share something, you're giving them that gift as well. So we're gonna do another quick exercise. Whoops. Where did that go? Oh gosh, I'm sorry. Technology. Technology indeed. Let me see if I can go back to the other slide. All right, mindful breathing break. There we go. Oh, oops, that's not the one. Okay. Yes, I told you this is my first time doing this. So, <laughs> so sun breaths, um, they're just like what we just did with mindful breathing. It's been sitting for a little bit. If you want to stand up, you can stand up and do this, or you can sit and do it. So if you do stand, just going to have your feet maybe about hip distance apart. Nice soft knees. Relaxed arms. And then breathing in, bringing the arms up like you're helping the sun to rise. And then breathing out, you can kind of little bend to your knees here as you come down. Sun to set. Breathing in, arms up. Breathing out, bringing the arms down. Head can come down to arms up and breathing in, head forward. Bring your head up, looking up at the sun or the ceiling. Back down. And one more. Again. And breathing out. Thank you for doing that with me. Feels good to move a little bit. And that's exactly what we're doing in this picture here. There we go. Recording is not working. That's all right. So, my role, so you'll notice. Um, my role is a mindful outdoor therapy guide, not therapist. <laughs> so I don't, my role isn't to die. Obviously I would have to have a different degree to do that. Um, but we're not diagnosing or treating anybody um, or are we suggesting any sort of um, outcome for the walk. Instead, I'm, I'm guiding people through a sequence of activities that are designed to help us slow down, help our senses to open, and possibly deepen this reciprocal relationship with the forest. So I offer invitations and those are suggestions for things to, to notice or increase your awareness, um, but they're not assignments and there's no right or wrong way to do them. And that can feel a little strange at first when, when you go out for a walk and your guide says, sit with a tree and notice what you notice. And maybe you sit with the tree and then there's a butterfly that catches your attention. That's okay. That's what you're noticing. Okay. So it's an open-ended practice. There's no expectation. And then a um, wonderful quote from Mr. Clifford, the forest is the therapist. The guide opens the doors. And that's all we're doing. What to expect? So there's three stages of a walk, but you wouldn't notice these stages at all. 
they just flow right in and out of each other. The first stage is known as connection. And this is kind of that threshold where we're shifting our awareness to our senses and possibly your mind is not as preoccupied with what you were thinking about before. Because your senses are giving you that steady stream of input, it allows you to just be present. And then when we are connected to the present moment, we enter into liminality. And liminal means to be in between two places or, or stages, kind of like when you're in between sleep and wake. Maybe it's that stage right before you fall asleep or right before you wake up. Um, so in forest bathing terms, it means that time when you're in the walk and you're not thinking about what time is it. You don't even really notice time. You're just so immersed in the present moment that you're not thinking about any of that. And then the incorporation phase, um, which is signaled by when we gather for a final time to share tea. So the tea ceremony is kind of marks that completion or that departure from liminality and also re-entry into ordinary life. And this quote here is from this young man. So sensory invitation, okay, this is fun. Did I give you the bottles or did I put them back in here? The what? The bottles? Yeah, sure. The jars. Uh, oh, they're right here. Oh, okay, so Josh was gonna pass around a couple of bottles. One has balsam fir and one has a uh, dried orange peel. Pick whatever one you want and you're welcome to keep it. Yes, so. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Um, it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you just pass them around to here. Depending on like the scent of one over the other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and just take uh take some orange peel or take some balsam fur. Oh, and Joshua, we want to get out, rest out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. I, I read recently that stimulating. The scent, the sense of smell, also connects with that part of the brain where memory results. Yes. And that it's a great idea sometime through the day, open a, open a jar of coffee, smell some bath oil, a big spanker, or whatever, something to stimulate that sense of smell. Right. It is very interesting how scent is connected to memory. And it's direct. It's, you know, uh -huh. If you smell something that can bring back to your childhood it is in a flash. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You notice they're pretty different from each other. And I discovered the, the orange pills. Um, I don't remember how that came across, but how I came upon that. Um, I think I was baking something and I needed uh I don't know. Anyway, I just discovered the scent of it was really just, it triggered something, like you said. It reminded me of something else and it was very pleasant and I decided I wanted to bottle it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's right. Did you roast it? Yeah, I let them dry out on the counter and then I put them in the oven on like warm, like 170 or so. And then, yeah, it's just... Yeah, who knew? And then we were up in the um, Twin Mountain area a few weeks ago. We were supposed to be on a snowmobiling trip, but it's not. It was a hiking. It was a hiking weekend instead, and we and there was balsam branches on the ground from the storm that had happened the week before, and so we were able to collect some of the boughs and capture that as well. Do you want to help me on what you can collect from the customers? And don't forget to make one for yourself. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Oh, oh yeah, thanks. So,
this object that you have here. Do a little exercise. So you notice how sometimes when you shut off one sense, the other ones become a little bit more alert. So I'm going to ask you to either close your eyes or just take like a soft gaze forward. And holding this object in your hand, and noticing what it feels like. Exploring different parts of it with your thumb. Soft. Sharp edges. what it would feel like if you pressed it against your palm or just gently rubbed it back and forth in the back of your hand. Bringing it up to your ear. And as you continue to feel it with your fingers, what sound does it make? Are there different sounds when you touch it in different ways? Maybe try even putting it right up against your ear. And then bringing up to your nose. And your inhale through the nose. And if you open your mouth slightly, the jaw open a little bit. Also taste the air around it. Rub on the texture. Does that change the scent? And then finally, just gently opening your eyes, looking at what you have in your hands. Maybe like you're seeing it for the very first time. Looking at this little object you just spent some time with. change in the color when you turn it over. What would a child see if they were looking at this? Breath. Before we go to question and answer, would anybody like to share what they're noticing? 
I'll start first. Noticing the sound of the clock ticking and how yes. quiet it's gotten in the library. And the smell of what I was holding is still in my hands. So, on to question and answer, and you're welcome to keep this. You spent some time with it now and got to know it. So another, another uh, wonderful tender of nature, John Muir. He has a lot of good quotable quotes. So question and answer, anything that we didn't, I didn't address while, um, while I was speaking or while I took some questions earlier. Now I'm going to put this on, make sure that this is, see this too, because that's the date for our, the walk. Thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Is that the next one? You're yes, June 20th. So that will be when we actually go out and, and do a walk for two hours. I just was on part of the Dover Community Trail. Last Saturday morning, there was a, a 5K race. Oh, in Dover, and my friend and I went. But we went with two. We were on walkers. Okay. Oh, we were dead last. Oh, <laughs> that's okay. But it was so nice. The police car was right behind us with the flash. Yeah. Lights. But everybody was so nice and kind and encouraging. But I, I, I've only seen a little bit of it. Yeah. It was very nice. It came on with the water flowing it down. Is. Coming out and down oh, the isn't it? River. I, I don't know where it was. The department of parent doing the Yeah, it actually oh, it was. was. Okay. So, so this the part. Trail. That's the part I was on. Okay. So this, I should have put on here. It's, this is the Watson Road entrance, which is the, the oh, rural yes. end. Yeah. Um, oh, so okay. it's, it's like gravelly, though. I'm not familiar with it, so. But the water is flowing. Uh, by there. Yeah. And yeah. Actually, it the, could be quite loud too because of all the rain we've had. So it's. Yeah. But when is this happening? Um, first day. June? Yep. June 20th, the first day of summer. Now, you'll give information on that to the library. Yes. They're actually going to be the ones hosting it. And so you'll sign up through them. What day of the week is that? Do? I think it's a Wednesday. I believe it's a Wednesday. But do you, I don't see your. Um, Oh, so for a website, I, I'm not on Instagram. Oh, okay. Yeah. So my new, you know what? I have business cards over here, and a, also you can sign up for my newsletter, and then I email out. This is where next walk's going to be, or like if I'm doing a presentation or something. So definitely um, grab a card. I have some a bigger card too that has more information on it. Definitely. And um, if you have your phone, you can. Scan the QR code and I'll take you right to the newsletter sign up. Mm -hmm. And then my social media is just mindful wandering NH. And but which, which part of the Dover Community Trail did you say? You it's on from? Watson Road. Um, oh, Watson, yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's like, uh, it's right past the charter school. Okay. Yep, on the left. If you're coming from County Farm Road, then it would be on the left. Okay. So it's a decent sized parking lot and the trail is wide enough and there's trash cans, even though they say carry in and carry out. There's no yeah. facilities. That is the one thing. There's no yeah. porta potty or it's like don't in the shuttle, woods. Don't shuttle up your coffee before you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, and there's a lot of little I mean, we'll probably stay mostly on the main trail, although I'll invite people if they want to go off to the side trails, they can do that too. And then, so you're probably wondering, well, if everybody's taken off, how do we get back together? <laughs> so generally I'll say, we're going to be doing this for roughly 15, 
10, 15 minutes, but I know not everybody's wearing a watch and I ask everybody to shut their, you know, either put it on do not disturb or leave it. So I call you back with an owl hoot or oh. the last time I think I used, do you remember what I did last time? It wasn't an owl hoot. It was something else I had just heard, like some sort of a burn or. The owl hoot, yeah, that's, that's an easier one to do. Um, and I just heard an owl last night in my house too. So, mm. so yes, I call everybody back with an owl hoot and then well, ideally everybody answers me back with a hoot back. I know a lot of people are self-conscious, like I don't wanna do that, but <laughs> it does help me to know where people are. And that way if somebody doesn't hear me and yeah. so they hear the other person hooting, then they're like, oh, okay. So that's how we, that's how we do that. And then there will be tea for that depending on, it might be pine needle, it might be, maybe if my cat mint plant comes back to life, it might be cat mint. Yes. Um, what did you do exactly to um, be trained or educated to be a guide? Yes. So um, the schools that I was trained through, um, the guide that I went my first walk with, he told me what they were. I went on their websites and ANFT, their training, they have, it's all virtual and they around the world and you, they have trainings like every few weeks, I want to say. It's pretty, it's like every six weeks they have a different. Three, three ones being um, advertised right now. Yeah. Yeah, because you could do a different time zone. Like you yeah. could do like the one I did was based out of uh, Singapore time, because uh, otherwise I wouldn't have been able to do it. It's my full time job, so it was like mm -hmm. four and five in the morning, four in the morning. Right. And then, but whether it was before or after daylight savings, because I guess Singapore it would change. But yeah. but that mean, meant that I could. Right. I could do it for the online part, both an online and a in person part. Yes. So you do the, the training is six months, the assignments, and then. Then the second part of that is a, an immersion where you you meet um, either your trainers or other trainers and you stay overnight somewhere for four nights and you do a complete second half of your training. It's wonderful. Yeah, I highly recommend it. <laughs> it's also nice that the Dolan Library makes some good things available. Yeah. And we've got a meditation class yeah. here um, with the the past few months in some way it's so helpful. Yeah. yeah, I like that. They seem to be doing a lot. Maybe I'm just noticing it more. I don't know, but I feel like there's been a lot more activities yeah. advertised. It's like it's more like a community center, yeah. but the world of libraries are changing. Right. They're incorporating what was right. Yes, it is really nice. Yeah. It's I mean they have yeah, the activities, the presentations, the events, whether it's like crafting or nature journaling or or this one i was a long time ago with my older son when he was little they had a beekeeper come and she brought in bees like in the you know behind glass and that was that was super interesting especially for a child too yeah. for, oh totally for an adult so it's like maybe we can do this they do have some really great programs here but definitely make sure um, you grab a card, sign up for the newsletter so that we know for sure when the next, because I, I might do another, well, I'll be at, definitely email, sending out an email blast and putting on social media about the walk that Robin and I are doing on um, May 18th. Yes, that one is in Milton at the uh, Casey Conservation Land. Sign up um, through the one shots or if I think if I think the card will I be able to find out more? Yeah, absolutely. On your website. Yep, yeah, you can and then my email is on there as should be on there as well. What day of the week is that one? That's a Saturday. Yeah. That's a Saturday morning. Yeah, my email's on the back. Yes. Well, thank you all so much for coming. Thank you.